In our headlines on this Wednesday afternoon, June 14th, here in South Korea. Findings for the month of May show expansion in employment, with a rise of over 350,000 jobs on year, which has pushed the country's jobless rate to record low since 1999, when officials began compiling relevant data. Over in the U.S., data shows consumer prices accelerating at a slower pace on year to post 4% in May, raising market prospects for a freeze in rate hikes by the Federal Reserve as policymakers open their June session. And the UN administration today continues to field questions at Parliament over the broader safety of Japan's plan to discharge radioactive wastewater from its devastated Fukushima nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean starting later this summer. Korea's labor market remains robust, with data for the month of May showing notable job expansion, especially among elderly workers, despite fewer openings in the manufacturing sector. Our Lee Soo-jin reports. Data from Statistics Korea released on Wednesday shows that there were 28.83 million people in employment last month, up more than 351,000 compared to the previous year. This is the 27th consecutive month that the nation has seen on-year growth in employment. Statistics Korea says May's strong figures compared to the year before were driven by the continued rise in in-person and outdoor activities. The employment rate of the working age population, those aged 15 to 64, rose 0.7 percentage points on year to stand at 69.9%. That's the highest figure on record. The nation's unemployment rate came to 2.7 percent, down 0.3 percentage points compared to the year before. It's the lowest unemployment figure for the month of May since 1999. On-year job growth was largely driven by the 60 and above age group, which recorded 379,000 more jobs than at the same time the previous year. Employment among those their 20s and below, however, fell for the seventh consecutive month. By sector, the health and welfare industry saw the most job additions, with 166,000 more than the previous year, followed by the accommodation and restaurant sectors. On the other hand, for the fifth straight month, the manufacturing industry recorded fewer jobs than the previous year amid sluggish exports but the on-year decline was smaller than the previous month. Meanwhile, during a job task force meeting on Wednesday, the first vice finance minister announced that the government has selected more industries to focus on to boost employment. These include construction and shipping. Detailed plans for bolstering employment in the selected sectors will be announced during an emergency economic meeting in July. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. Korea's ICT industry posted a trade surplus of some 3.3 billion U.S. dollars in May, despite an overall plunge in exports. According to the Trade Ministry on Wednesday, the total value of tech exports last month totaled above 14 billion U.S. dollars, which marks a drop of over 28 percent on year. The ministry links the drop to lackluster demand as well as the base effect given last May's record surge. By products, semiconductors plunged almost 36 percent on year amid cheaper costs, while smartphones fell more than 17 percent on weaker demand. Over in the U.S., the latest economic data there shows the pace of inflation slowing tangibly, raising prospects of a freeze in interest rates by the U.S. Federal Reserve. Our Moon Herian reports. Consumer prices in the United States show the smallest annual rise in over two years just ahead of the Fed's rate decision. According to the U.S. Labor Department on Tuesday local time, the country's consumer price index in May increased by 4 percent compared to the same month last year. This is a sharp drop compared to the on-year rise of 4.9 percent in April. On-year CPI figures, which measure price changes for goods and services, have been falling for the past 11 months now, and this latest figure marks the lowest annual rise since March 2021. On a monthly basis, CPI rose by just 0.1 percent. The slowdown in price hikes was attributed to a drop in energy prices such as gasoline and electricity, as well as smaller food price hikes. 
Gasoline prices reportedly dropped by 5.6 percent, while electricity fell for the third month in a row. Food prices showed a slight increase of 0.2 percent, but prices of meat and fish showed a downswing, as did the price of eggs, which fell by nearly 14 percent on month, the sharpest drop since 1951. On the other hand, the core consumer price index, which excludes those more volatile categories, remained well above the Fed's 2 percent target at 5.3 percent in May. Core inflation was driven by surging rent and auto prices as prices of used cars and trucks increased by 4.4 percent on year. U.S. President Joe Biden called the latest data good news and continued progress, but said there was more work to do. This report comes just ahead of a meeting of U.S. central bank officials on Wednesday to announce the latest key interest rate decision. The Fed has increased its benchmark interest rate 10 consecutive times since March 2022 in an effort to bring down inflation, and this latest data has spurred belief that the Fed will pause hikes. S&P 500 and Nasdaq stocks closed at their highest in over a year on Tuesday in anticipation of a rate hike freeze. Moon Hedan, Arirang News. Meanwhile, at the National Assembly on this Wednesday, the UN administration faces its final day of fielding questions from lawmakers on state affairs. Today, the issues of interest are labor intensive as lawmakers lock horns over the government's interaction with the country's trade unions. The ruling People Power Party accuses the unions of unlawful strikes, while the opposition Democratic Party accuses the administration of labor repression. Also, the presidential veto of the Nursing Act and the government's response to last year's tragic Itaewon crowd crush will likely be addressed. Last but not least, Japan's radioactive wastewater discharge plan looks to be further discussed. And speaking of Fukushima's radioactive wastewater, South Korea's ambassador to Japan says Tokyo needs to persuade South Koreans about the safety of its upcoming discharge plan. Speaking to Japan's Gigi Press on Wednesday, Ambassador Yoon Dok Min called on Japan to, quote, directly tell Koreans that its plan is safe. He also noted that Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida during his Seoul visit had claimed the plan will not be handled in a way that harms the health of people in both countries or the marine environment. President Yoon Seok-yeol is scheduled to visit France and Vietnam next week to further promote regional economic interests and more. Our top office correspondent Oh Soo-young has a preview of his agenda. Embarking on a six-day trip beginning next Monday, President Yoon seok will set out to strengthen economic security cooperation with France and Vietnam. According to Yoon's office, the South Korean leader will hold a summit with President Emmanuel Macron next Tuesday during his trip to Paris to attend a presentation as part of the 2030 World Expo bidding process. Based on their shared universal values of freedom, human rights and rule of law, the two presidents will share their respective plans to collaborate and engage with the Indo-Pacific region particularly with Ho elected as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, Yuna Macron will discuss global security issues, presumably North Korea's nuclear threat and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. They will also talk business, with their bilateral trade volume having reached 13 billion US dollars last year. While focusing on securing jobs for future generations and economic growth engines, the leaders will discuss ways to expand investment and deepen cooperation in the fields of economy, security, AI, space, high-tech and future industries. Yun will take part in three business-related events, a dialogue with young people at the world's largest startup campus, Station F, an investment declaration ceremony and a digital vision forum where he'll declare an initiative to establish new global digital norms. Next Thursday, Yun begins his diplomatic schedule in Vietnam, his first official state trip to Southeast Asia since taking office. An official summit will take place on Friday with President Phu Van Tong, followed by separate meetings with the Vietnamese Prime Minister and National Assembly Chair before a state banquet. Accompanied by his biggest ever economic delegation of some 205 corporate leaders, including the chiefs of South Korea's biggest conglomerates, Samsung, SK, LG, Hyundai, Lotte and HANA groups. Yun will attend four key economic events, including a bilateral trade exposition, a luncheon and a forum for some 500 business people. You will also hold a dialogue on expanding research collaboration with young people in digital sectors. 
There are three key points. First, expanding service and infrastructure exports. Second, supporting solidarity between future generations. And third, strengthening digital leadership. Yun's diplomatic outreach comes at a time of geopolitical rivalry in the region and trade uncertainty, with South Korea looking to strengthen its economic and security partnerships in order to pursue its national interest as well as global peace and prosperity. Oh Soo-young, Arirang News. Meanwhile, on this Wednesday, neighboring Tokyo, top security officials representing South Korea, the U.S. and Japan are holding talks on issues of trilateral interest. According to Seoul's top office, National Security Advisor Cho Tae-yong is sitting down with his counterparts Jake Sullivan and Takeo Akiba. On the agenda are regional and broader concerns, including North Korea and the future course of the trilateral framework. Cho is also poised to hold separate bilateral exchanges with his U.S. and Japanese counterparts. Former U.S. President Donald Trump was in federal court on Tuesday to fight allegations that he took hundreds of secret documents from the top office when he stepped down and attempted to block authorities from retrieving them. Our e j says he has pleaded not guilty. Facing 37 charges related to allegations that he kept hundreds of classified documents after leaving office while also failing to return them to federal record keepers, Former U.S. President Donald Trump pleaded not guilty to all the charges. And Trump's latest legal battle means he becomes the first U.S. president, either former or current, to face federal charges. Making his appearance at the Miami Federal Courthouse on Tuesday, Trump was read a list of charges, including willful retention of national defense information, conspiracy to obstruct justice, corruptly concealing a document or record, concealing a document in a federal investigation and making false statements and representations. Tuesday's court appearance also marks the second time in over two months that the former president was arraigned on criminal charges. Earlier in April, Trump pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records, which stemmed from a probe into payments he made to adult film star Stormy Daniels in return for keeping quiet over an alleged affair. However, this might not be the end of the 45th president's legal troubles, as U.S. Justice Department Special Counsel Jack Smith is also investigating efforts made by Trump and his close allies to overturn President Joe Biden's 2020 election victory. Still, a large number of Trump supporters showed up near the federal courthouse to cheer on the former president, while anti-Trump supporters were also at the scene to protest. Special Counsel Smith said last week that he would be seeking a speedy trial which, by legal definition, mean proceedings could begin within 70 days. However, legal experts say there are few factors that could push the date back much further. Lee seung Arirang News. The United Nations has placed its weight behind calls for the creation of a global AI watchdog amid mounting concerns over its potential risks. Our Chong eun details. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has backed a proposal by some artificial intelligence executives for the creation of an international AI watchdog body. The UN chief said at a news conference on Monday that he plans to appoint a scientific advisory board in a few days and an advisory board on artificial intelligence in September to regularly review AI governance arrangements and offer recommendations on how they can align with human rights, the rule of law and the common good. He also said he would react favorably to a new UN agency on artificial intelligence and suggested the International Atomic Energy Agency as a model, which is knowledge-based and has some regulatory powers. Guterres said he plans to gather a lot of opinions on the just-released principles for the UN Code of Conduct for Information Integrity on Digital Platforms, which he will issue before next year's UN Summit of the Future. Alarm bells over the latest form of artificial intelligence generative AI are deafening and they are loudest from the developers who designed it. We must take those warnings seriously. Generative AI technology that can create authoritative prose from text prompts has captivated the public since ChatGPT was launched six months ago. Concerns over AI, however, have been growing over its ability to create defake pictures and other misinformation. 
Guterres added a model based on IAEA could be very interesting, but noted that only member states can create it, not the Secretariat of the United Nations. The Vienna-based IAEA was created in 1957 and promotes the safe, secure and peaceful use of nuclear technologies while watching for possible violations of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. It has 176 member states. Meanwhile, ChatGPT's creator OpenAI said last month that a body like the AIEA could inspect systems, test for compliance with safety standards and place restrictions on degrees of deployment and levels of security. Tong Eun-ju, Arirang News. Back here in Seoul, an annual gathering to advance cultural interactions took place Tuesday evening at the official residence of the French ambassador here in the capital city, and my colleague Che Suyang was there to take a look. Hidden talent, the joy of sharing. The Korea Image Communication Institute held its annual culture communication forum on Tuesday night. The event was held at French ambassador's residence and was attended by ambassadors and cultural leaders from countries such as Germany, Italy and Switzerland. Yeah. Yeah. Philippe Lefort, the French ambassador to Korea, demonstrated his taekwondo skills. He started taekwondo when he came to Korea so that he could see the spiritual soul of the country. At the forum, he performed his top three favorite forms, Taegak 7, Taegak 8, and Kumgang. So I've been practicing uh, fencing, uh, French boxing, uh, another French, uh, not that much well known sport. And I've been practicing also karate and uh, today uh, uh, taekwondo. Another guest was someone who had become deeply immersed in the essence of Korea's traditional pansori music and had chosen to leave behind their life in France to pursue the path of sorikun or pansori vocalists. I was attracted to pansori at the Korean Cultural Center in 2016. As I continue to do it, it feels like therapy to help me heal my heart. The German ambassador played Chopin's Nocturne No. 20, which he said always gives him unbelievable moments. A magician Edward Guan performed his magic tricks for the crowd. The chairman of CICI said she hopes more people can share their love of Korean culture with the world. It is a universal wish to live a long life with a young heart. To do so, I believe it is essential to be positive, communicate well, and share with others. That is why we prepared the hidden talent today. The CICI's annual forum aims to become a cultural stepping stone between Korea and the world. Che Su-hyung, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. In Ukraine, at least 11 civilians were killed on Tuesday in the city of Krivirich following Russia-launched missile strikes. The strikes hit an apartment building and warehouses. Medical authorities say seven people were killed in the warehouses and four in the apartment block. 25 others were wounded. The city attacked is the hometown of President Volodymyr Zelensky, and the attack has drawn condemnation from the Ukrainian leader. On the same day, Russian President Vladimir Putin said he believes that Ukraine has lost 25 to 30 percent of its Western-supplied military vehicles since it began its counter-offensive. Speaking during a televised conference, he said that while Russia has lost 50 tanks, Ukraine has lost 160. He also alleged that Ukraine's recent casualties are 10 times greater than those suffered by Russia. Turning over to the United Kingdom, a man has been arrested on suspicion of killing three people in the city of Nottingham. Police arrested a 31-year-old suspect over the stabbings of two 19-year-old students on a Tuesday morning local time. The suspect then allegedly stole a white van at another location fatally stabbing the driver, a man in his 50s. The vehicle was then used in an attempt to run over people at a bus stop. Three people there were injured. 
Both of the killed students are confirmed to have been students at the University of Nottingham. The motive for the attack is not clear and counter-terror police are assisting the investigation. Former Beatles member Paul McCartney says that a new and final song by the world-famous band has been completed with the help of artificial intelligence. Speaking in an interview on Tuesday, the 80-year-old musician said he used the technology to extricate the voice of late Beatles frontman John Lennon from an old demo. Lennon's voice was then used to finish a decades-old song. Although McCartney did not give the title of the song, it's thought to be a 1978 composition by Lennon called Now and Then. Lennon had composed a number of tracks on cassettes before his death in 1980. These were later given to McCartney by Lennon's widow. The new song is due to be released later this year. And finally, the Guinness Book of Records confirmed on Tuesday a new world record holder for the longest cooking marathon. Known by her social media name, Hilda Bashi, the 26-year-old chef from Nigeria is recorded as having cooked for 93 hours and 11 minutes. She began on Thursday, May 11th, and finished on Monday, May 15th. The stunt saw Bashi cook more than 100 pots of food in a makeshift kitchen. Bashi had hoped to set the record at 100 hours, but record officials deducted almost 7 hours over a break that lasted longer than the 5-minute break each hour allowed in such marathons. Still, her final result was 5 hours longer than the previous best, set in 2019 by a chef in India. Matthew Ashley, Adidang News. Good afternoon. We are having a repeat of yesterday's weather conditions. Expecting passing bands of rain in today, more regions will be getting rain showers and thunderstorms ramping up again with the possibility of hail in eastern parts of the country with 5 to 60 millimeters in the forecast. But precipitation will be vary depending on the region. But once it starts to rain, it will pour down, dropping 30 millimeters an hour. Rain should mainly fall around lunchtime into the evening commute, so please keep an umbrella handy. Afternoon highs are similar to Tuesday, hovering in the upper 20s this afternoon. The capital region is having highs that are a couple of degrees higher than yesterday. Air quality will be decent nationwide, while the ozone level remains high during the day today. Now, another passing rain is in the forecast in the eastern parts of the country tomorrow. Then temperatures will go up further each day, perhaps reaching up to 32 degrees Celsius here in the capital next Monday. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. And those are the headlines at this hour, but do stay with us for our panel session coming up next. Thank you for now.